Thursday, July the 22nd. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Board of Multnomah County Commissioners. The health and safety of our community and staff members are at the forefront of our minds as we continue to navigate county business in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. In accordance with the declaration of emergency announced on March 11th of 2020 and extended by the Board of County Commissioners on June 24th, 2021, today's meeting is being held virtually. To align with social distancing guidelines, some rules associated with Board of County Commissioner meetings will be temporarily altered. Please remember to mute your not mic when you are not speaking and when you present, make sure to unmute your mic and check that your camera is on. May I please have a motion on the consent calendar? So moved. Second. Commissioner Stegman moves. Commissioner Myron seconds. Approval of the consent calendar. Marina, please take a roll call vote. Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Oh, maybe she's not on the call yet. Uh, Chair Kafori? Aye. The consent calendar is approved. Marina? Marina, you didn't hear my name, but I vote aye. Oh my, oh my gosh. That's okay. I think, I think I panicked after JVP. <laughs> right. I, it, doesn't, yeah, it doesn't work without JVP. <laughs> so sorry. Um, so we do have a, one person signed up for public testimony, but I'm not seeing them on the call. Um, I will reach out to them to see if they have any written remarks. Um, <clears throat> should I go to R1? Yes, please. R1, R proclaim, proclamation declaring July 18th through July 24th, 2021 as pretrial probation and parole supervision week in Multnomah County, Oregon. So moved. Second. Commissioner My <clears throat> Myron moved. I didn't catch you seconded because I think several. Oh, okay, that was Commissioner Vega Peterson. Second approval of R1. Good morning. Again, and good morning DCJ team for our 1st board item this morning. We are recognizing July 18th through the 24th as pre trial probation and parole supervision week in Multnomah County. This occasion is a chance for us to recognize the indispensable work that the staff in our Department of Community Justice do every day to help people find a viable supported path out of the criminal justice system and back into the community. DCJ's work isn't just necessary. It's also broad and diverse. And while people might not be familiar with the roles of probation and parole officers, there are so many others who play an important part in the ways that DCJ helps keep the community safe. Corrections counselors and technicians, juvenile court counselors, community works leaders, support personnel, and even volunteers and in interns. Together, these professionals are essential to our efforts to promote safety, prevent harm, and heal trauma, and not just among individuals, but in our community at large. And I want to be sure to acknowledge that this task, while important all the time, has never been easy, and it only got harder over the last 16 months because of the pandemic. Our programs and our employees have worked so hard to adjust their services, find new <clears throat> and adapted ways of supporting our clients and our community, while also keeping people safe from the virus. And at the same time, DCJ has been integral to offering support and advocacy for community members who have been harmed and traumatized by violence. The work of our Victims and Survivor Services Unit has been especially important. And I wanna recognize that DCJ's work is taking place during a pivotal time for our community's approach to public safety and criminal justice. We have been and continue to be engaged in an intensive effort to meaningfully transform and reorient those systems toward deflection, diversion, and healing and especially by eliminating the disproportionate harm inflicted on Black, Indigenous, and other communities of color. The voice of DCJ's leadership employees has been vital in this effort, in part because they have been at the forefront of this transformative work for so many years. Efforts like the HEAT curriculum, the Community Healing Initiative, Flip the Script, demonstrate that moving away from incarceration in favor of services that help people heal, learn, and recover and reintegrate our, our more holistic reflection and a more effective approach to true community safety. I'm very grateful that we have this opportunity before us today to recognize and thank the county's pre-trial probation and parole supervision professionals for all they do 
And now I'll hand it off to Erica Pruitt. Thank you so much, Chair Kafori, and um, good morning, Board of County Commissioners. My name is Erica Pruitt, and I am the Director of the Department of Community Justice. And again, I thank you, Chair Kafori, and um, our County Commissioners for allowing us to be here today to celebrate pre-child probation and parole supervision year, supervision week. Every year, the American Probation and Parole Association and community corrections departments across the country and Canada honor the thousands of probation and parole and community supervision professionals who play a vital role in public safety and work to change lives. I am proud to be a part of APA's executive committee as past president, and I want to underscore the theme of this year's celebration, recognizing heroes in the field. It is important to take time to recognize the work that our staff do every day to help individuals change their lives, restore their families, and build stronger communities. The theme of recognizing heroes in the field is even more relevant this year as our staff continue to provide services to our justice-involved individuals and their families. In the midst of COVID-19 pandemic, and the increase in community violence that has spread across our country. We are here today to share a glimpse of the excellent work that our staff do. I have Dina Corso, Division Director for Juvenile Services Division, and Jay Scroggin, our Adult Services Division Director. We want to take the next couple of minutes to provide you with an overview of the work we do, and I'm going to turn it over to Dina to begin. Thanks, Erica. Good morning, Chair Kafori and Commissioners. I am Dina Corso, the Division Good Director. Good morning. I, the Division Director for Juvenile Services. Like Erica, I am extremely proud of how our staff have continued to provide services to our youth and families during the COVID-19 pandemic. Unlike many county operations, the need to provide in-person direct service at JSD never stopped. Our juvenile custody service specialists, detention managers, nutrition services staff, and many of our support staff have come to work daily just like they did pre-pandemic. They've re remained focused and committed through the pandemic, wildfires, ice storm, and most recently, the heat wave. I would like to thank the staff who have supported the health and well-being of the youth residing in our detention facility and our assessment and evaluation residential program uh, as well as those who have provided essential support to ensure that JSD's daily operations ran smoothly throughout the pandemic. I would also like to provide a special shout out to the nutrition services team. Not only have they continued to provide food for the youth in our facility and the staff and partners who are working in the building, they have gone above and beyond to provide by providing meals for shelters that were opened to respond to COVID-19 and the recent heat wave. In addition, they are providing lunches for our ASD mental health unit mobile van to serve justice involved individuals and others who visit the van. I'm also very proud of our juvenile court counselors who've been working hard to maintain connection with the youth and families on their caseloads. For months, they had to shift to virtual check-ins in addition to in-person when needed. Their connection to the youth has been an important factor in decreasing the number of youth placed in detention. In addition, the rise in community violence has dramatically impacted some of the youth and families we serve. We've been working closely with our community partners to identify what additional supports and services are needed, and we thank the board for additional investments to help in this effort. I'd like to highlight the collaboration we have with our juvenile justice system partners, which has continued to strengthen throughout the pandemic. Thanks to our effective partnership, we've been able to maintain our detention population at or below 50% capacity, which is critical for mitigating the risk of spreading the virus to youth and staff in detention. The FY 2022 budget reflects a decrease in detention beds, proving that our focus is working. This budget reduction means that we can invest in community-based alternatives where our youth live instead of placing them in detention. While we are in the midst of responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, we continue to forge ahead with identifying how we can serve our youth and families better. This past year, we brought together system partners virtually, of course, to create goals and plans to transform juvenile probation. We are a part of a national effort to transform juvenile probation that is focused on promoting positive behavior change and diversion rather than surveillance and sanctions. 
I look forward to updating you all at a future time on our plans. I would now like to turn it over to Jay, who will talk about our adult services division. Good morning, Chair Kafori, Board of Commissioners. Hello, my name is Jay Scrog, and I am the director of I am the division director of adult services. Like Dina, I am proud and very appreciative of how our staff have responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. Our staff and our RECOG unit has continued to come in every day despite the pandemic. The activities that have been taking place at the Justice Center, as well as dealing with the natural disasters that we have all faced. Our field officers, our, our field offices have been closed this past year and a half, but our staff have continued to find ways to connect with justice involved individuals and victims and survivors. They have responded to immediate public safety con concerns and prioritize bringing key services back online based on business needs. For example, we are very excited to have our community service program up and running once again. Staff have also been creative in thinking about how to deliver services differently. For example, our mental health unit has launched our outreach team to deliver basic needs to individuals experiencing homelessness. Our records technicians, corrections counselors, correction technicians, and office assistants have also all found creative ways to support our department as they primarily work from home. This includes working to switch our paper records to an electronic filing system. I wanna thank the team who have been working with our units over the past year to make this switch possible. Lastly, our staff have been, important, have been an important partner in the response to community violence. Our gang and family services units have played an active role in addressing public safety issues and supporting the justice involved individuals and their families who have been impacted by this increase in violence. Our officers are key partners to other law enforcement agencies who are working to get guns off the street. For example, one of our parole and probation officers played a key role in a mission that resulted in the in, in, uh, arrest of a gang member and the confiscation of a large number of firearms and drugs. Our Family Services Unit will soon be increasing important support as they expand the number of community health specialists who connect justice-involved parents to resources and services. In addition, this unit has been able to provide resources such as books and access to camps to families impacted by gun violence and served by this unit. I would now like to turn it back over to Erica, who will highlight the work that our Director's Office and read the proclamation. Thank you, Jay. Like JSD and ASD, the director's office had to pivot quickly to a new way of operating. I would like to thank our human resources team for continuing to provide support and resources to the many staff who have questions about how things are changing as we determine what the future of work look like, looks like. Our business applications team provided much assistance to those employees who had never had access to technology at home and continues to problem solve with our staff. Our business services team has been in constant contact with our providers, helping them navigate this uncertain time. In addition, members of this team worked hard to adjust our department's budget to address the changes we needed to make in response to COVID-19 and help guide the allocation of important federal funding. Our research and planning team are helping us memorialize and learn from this remarkable time by researching the impact of COVID-19 for our operations in our community. They have produced a report that captures the experience of, of our staff, our justice involved individuals and survivors. This report is informing DCJ's work group that is discussing what the future of work looks like for our department. Our volunteer and intern coordinator has kept volunteers and interns interested and engaged in the work of our department, despite having to make a, take a pause and offering some of their services. We are proud that this year we have six college to county interns placed throughout our department. Given the challenge of operating in a pandemic, we are hopeful that our work with interns can continue to grow. 
Our Victim and Survivor Services Unit has been working hard to connect survivors to resources and financial assistance. As you know, calls are up and local domestic violence services providers have been experiencing an increase in survivors accessing their services. We also have a project manager who has been working tirelessly to protect the health and safety of people in our facilities and working in the field while also facilitating office movement within our department. I want to make sure that I recognize and thank the county communications office for the effort they have made every year to share the range of work our staff do. I have enjoyed following social media stories this week, summarizing the work of our mental health unit, our juvenile um, garden program, and our victim and survivor services. Much of the public is unaware of the depth and the breadth of what this department does, and the stories they create help educate and hopefully inspire people to get more involved. I would like to close again by thanking all of the staff who work towards our vision community safety through positive change. It is an honor to serve as a director of this department. And as we talk about recognizing the heroes in the field, I think it's also important to acknowledge the loss. We have lost some staff this year, and we know that we have staff who have lost family members to COVID-19. And I want to take a moment to honor their uh, memories. And now we have the proclamation. Chair Kafori, would you like me to go ahead and read the proclamation? Please, Erica. Thank you. Before the Board of County Commissioners for Multnomah County, Oregon, declaring July 18th to July 24th, 2021, as pre trial probation and parole. Supervision Week in Multnomah County, Oregon. But the Multnomah Board of County Commissioner finds the Department of Community Justice staff possess a wide variety of skills and experiences that help to meet the vision of the department, community safety through positive change. DCJ staff treat justice involved individuals and youth and their families with dignity while recognizing the right of the public to be safeguarded from criminal activity. DCJ staff o supervises over 10,000 adult probationers and parolees annually, processes over 24,000 cases in our recognizant unit, recognizance unit, receives over 2,200 youth referrals and serves approximately 875 youth and their families, which includes diversion, informal, and formal supervision. DCJ staff uses best practices when holding justice involved individuals accountable as they deliver supervision, sanctions, and treatment resources to improve public safety and address the factors that drive crime. DCJ staff works in partnership with law enforcement and community agencies toward a shared vision of a safer community. DCJ staff respects victim rights and are dedicated to providing services and protection for survivors. DCJ staff advocates for the restoration of communities harmed by crime and delinquent behavior, and DCJ staff integrates trauma-informed practices and brain science into our work and applies an equity lens to inform our decisions. And DCJ staff have continued to provide services to our justice-involved individuals and their families in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. This includes staff who have kept 24 seven operations open, detention, the assessment and evaluation residential program and the cognizant unit. Other staff quickly pivoted to working remotely and came up with creative ways to provide supervision and services to justice involved individuals and survivors. DCJ staff recognizes that their public safety impact is long term, helping justice involved individuals to change their behavior, restore their families, and build stronger and safer communities. The Multnomah County Board of County Commissioners proclaims July 18th to July 24th, 2021, is declared pretrial probation and parole supervision week in Multnomah County, Oregon, in honor, recognition, and respect 
for the dedication and contribution of the county's community justice staff adopted this 22nd day of July of 2021. Thank you, Erica. Commissioners, questions or comments? Uh, we'll start with you, Commissioner Myron. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Erica. I um, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, it's a little it's a little choppy. I'm gonna stop video. See if that works. Okay. Basically, I mean, I I really want to um, express how um, how meaningful this proclamation is, uh, particularly at this uh, point in time, and with all that that the county, the department, uh, all of our um, all of our residents have gone through this past year, year and a half. Um, you know, the, the leadership is just brilliant. And thank you, Erica and Jay and Dina for being here and the work that you do. And, uh, you know, Erica leading the national organization. It, there's so much that you all do. Um, and the people working on the front line that do the work every single day are incredible and they have engaged in truly heroic efforts over the past year with the you know as you described so much of what they do with the pivoting um with looking at the future of work what we can learn from this um and for just being out there and doing the work day after day um not only supporting people through the trauma that they are experiencing in our community but experiencing that trauma themselves and the trauma of what what they are going through as individuals with with family members who may become sick who become sick themselves with the challenges uh, they've needed to face day to day, and I was so, so sorry to hear about um, those who were lost in in the department and in their families. Uh, so, people truly are heroes, and I am just so pleased to support this proclamation today, where we can honor the work um, that has been done, shine a light on that, and um, and really highlight what a brilliant um group of people we have working in our dcj uh and doing all of the work parole probation and direct service um all the time thank you thank you commissioner jaipal thank you chair Thank you so much, um, Erica, Dina, and Jay. Thanks for being here and bringing this forward. Um, you know, thank you for your leadership and the work that you do every day. Uh, the theme seems so fitting to me, recognizing heroes in the field. And as Commissioner Myron said, it seems particularly appropriate at this point in time. Um, the job that, that your staff do in the best of times is a really challenging job. They are dealing with people at the worst points of their lives. They are dealing with families in trauma, communities in trauma. And to do that on top of this public health crisis um, that as Commissioner Myron said also that they themselves are personally dealing with. And then layer on top of that, um, the wonderful movement of racial justice and the spotlight that it has shone on our public safety systems, I think is an added layer um, both of opportunity and and of responsibility that that I can only imagine has has heightened um, the challenge of their job. So, so much of what you said, um, I, I deeply appreciate. You know, Dina mentioning that we've kept the the population at less than fifty percent. I think that's a really concrete example of the fact that we can create change um, through all of these challenges. Um, you know, Jay, the work that your teams have done in responding to the spike in gun violence. I think there's a lot of emphasis placed on the policing aspect of responding to gun violence. And 
as you've said, Erica, people don't fully understand the range of work that parole and probation does and its role in um, both responding to and preventing gun violence. And I think that's been incredibly important. And victim services, uh, gun violence, domestic violence has spiked. And I know that the, the demand on those folks has increased so much as well. So deeply appreciative for all of that. You know, I think um, one, of the, one of the themes that shines through for me is that to create public safety, we can create accountability plus successful re-entry into community plus keeping families together plus keeping communities together and that's really what what all of your heroes do so deeply appreciative um and you know just really really pleased to be able to support this proclamation thank you commissioner vega peterson Thank you, Chair. So I'm always so grateful when we um, get to have this proclamation because it's an opportunity for all of us to hear, um, get updated on the work of what's happened um, in DCJ. And it's also, I really enjoy the articles that always accompany it in the Wednesday Wire um, and getting to read some of those stories about the work that's doing. And I think this the, the article that was published this week about the work that was, the outreach work that was happening was really, um, really touching and such a great picture of the work that's being done. So um, Erica and Jay and Dina, thank you so much for bringing the proclamation forward, um, for presenting today and uplifting the great work of our pretrial probation and parole supervision staff. Um, and I do wanna add my thanks to all of the staff here at Multnomah County for their commitment that they've had to community safety and dedication um, to supporting those that are that are impacted by our justice system. You know, it's been said many already many times that this is such an unprecedented year and to hear how the staff have shown up to serve in the midst of COVID and natural disasters, um, the protest and unrest and um, really the tragic surge in um, community violence that's taking place here and throughout the country. Um, it's it's just really um, amazing the dedication and, and such um, something I have so much respect for, you know. And we've been having a conversation over the last year about how our community is going to be grappling with the, the multiple challenges that are going to require the response and coordination for all of our systems. Um, we see the gun violence crisis devastating our communities, and, and we know that we have to think differently about the roles of law enforcement and the pretrial and probation and, um, and parole supervision systems. Um, how that works in terms of ensuring community safety is such an important conversation, and I'm glad this is one that we're that we're grappling with. We have to have that strong coordination um, within our systems, um, with our court system and our justice systems and law enforcement, um, to have you know healthier relationships and and to be able to actually enact that change that we that we need to see. And and I think every one of our employees understands this, understands it's necessary, and is and is committed to doing that. Um, and you know, and I just want to say I really appreciated the beautiful op-ed, Erica, that you and um, Ebony Clark, our health department director, had in the in the Oregonian, where you talked about you know how you see our community as Black women who were born in Portland, as government leaders, as wives and mothers, and what has to be done to prevent violence and to heal the wounds of violence. And one of the things that you said really struck me is that to become a safer city, we must bring all voices forward to participate in healing and work towards building trust and wholeness. And I think that is the exact sentiment that we need to embrace as we as we try to address the multiple challenges that we face. So I'm so proud of every single member of, of our team, of your teams, who work to bring together that the, the vision and the voices to support our community members and really to, to envision how we can build that um, better um, public safety system and have accountability there. So just really appreciate this. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you uh, to all of you, Erica and uh, Dina and Jay, and, and also uh, as important and maybe perhaps more important, uh, the hundreds of people um, that stand with you and behind you that carry out this work every day that rarely uh, get recognized. Uh, and so just really, uh, really a heartfelt thanks uh, to all the unseen work that we don't see every day. Uh, this reminds me of uh, uh, one of our earlier commissioners, Commissioner Shipwreck. I always uh, was so uh, touched by her approach around um, community justice. And I distinctly remember her, you know, talking about 
Do we want to just punish people or do we want to restore people? And I think really that this proclamation and the work that you all do is about restoration. And sometimes I think that that gets lost because you all have a hard job. Uh, it's not glamorous. It's very difficult. It's very challenging and it's shifting uh, in a really good and positive way. But I think some people still have a different perspective on what they think community justice is or, or was. So you have a lot of you have a lot of work in front of you, but you've also accomplished a lot by changing that paradigm of let's get upstream and help people so that they don't have to come uh, through our through our doors. Uh, you know, I love all the things that you talked about. I mean, people don't talk about, oh yeah, that your staff went out and did nutrition. Uh, even though, you know, your, your, your community justice, there's just a lot of things that, that you all do to get upstream, uh, to help our community members. Uh, you know, I, I really appreciate when I went out to, <clears throat> uh, POIC high school, I, I've seen the parent, uh, handbook that helps parents navigate when they have a youth involved in the criminal justice system. Uh, that's amazing. Like I have never seen a resource or a government entity do anything like that, that really uh, is working with families of those um, youth, uh, all the work that you do around survivors. Uh, you know, there's just a whole nother side of this work uh, than just people being incarcerated or on probation. Uh, there's just a lot of community work going on. Uh, and, you know, the juvenile garden program, I mean, again, those are all just examples of how we can get upstream and, um, you know, Jay and Dina and Erica, uh, I know that all of you, your heart is in this work. And uh, I've always been so impressed um, about the humanity that you bring to incredibly difficult and challenging work. And uh, I think that's mostly what, what shines through today uh, and what you represent uh, for all the employees and staff that you manage. And uh, we are really grateful. I'm grateful. Thank you for your work. Marina, would you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kapori? Aye. The proclamation is adopted. Thank you. R2, resolution to extend the emergency declared in executive rule 392 to October 15, 2021 or until rescinded. So moved. Second. <laughs> Commissioner Stegman moves. Commissioner Jayapal seconds. Approval of R2. While the 4th of July is behind us, the risk of devastating fires remains. And in fact, right now, as we all know, because it's in the New York Times, Oregon is home to multiple large fires, including the largest fire in the country, the bootleg fire. Our traditional fire seasons are starting earlier and the potential for major fires is as high as it's ever been thanks to the additional factors of drought conditions and high temperatures across the state. On July 1st, I issued a declaration of emergency banning the sale and use of fireworks in unincorporated Multnomah County, joining other local jurisdictions who also recognized the outside danger it posed. It was a difficult decision to make, but hearing from the fire departments that the ban did make an impact in reducing fires related to fireworks confirmed that it was the right action to take. From June 23rd to July 6th, it traced just nine fires to fireworks, and that's down from 44 over the same period just last year. With much of the summer remaining, little if any reprieve from risky conditions on the horizon, and out of an abundance of caution, I'm asking the board to extend the ban on fireworks through October 15th of 2021. Liz Smith Curry from my staff is here to explain the resolution. And we also have David Blankville from the county attorney's office. If folks have any uh, legal questions, Liz will try to answer the legal questions, but we brought David in just in case. <laughs> Thank you, chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Liz Smith Curry. I'm a senior policy advisor to chair Kafori. 
Um, as the chair mentioned on July 1st, um, she issued a ban on the sale and use of fireworks in unincorporated Multnomah County, joining other local jurisdictions taking the same action due to the extreme heat and dry conditions. That executive rule expires on July 31st and under county code, a de declaration of emergency may be extended by the board. Fireworks present an unreasonable risk of firefighters, wildfires under these dry conditions. And so we are asking the board to extend the ban until October 15th. We've reached out to the fire defense board and fire districts locally <clears throat> and the cities within our jurisdictions jurisdiction to let them know that we're taking this action and to get their feedback. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. <clears throat> David, did you have prepared remarks or are you just here as a backup, backup singer? <laughs> you do not want me to backup sing, uh, <laughs> just to answer questions. All right, thank you. Uh, Marina, did we receive any public testimony in this item? No, Madam Chair. All right, uh, commissioners, we're going to start with Commissioner Stegman. Questions or comments? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Liz. Uh, I completely agree. I mean, it's all etched in our memories. I think the Eagle Creek fire and how that came literally up to the doorsteps almost of Troutdale, which is insane because that is something that has never occurred uh, in, in my recollection. Uh, so uh, fires are, are real and dangerous. And uh, if you'll all recall, it was started by a firework. Uh, so I think this is prudent uh, for us to continue. Uh, Liz, I would, if you could just maybe expand a little bit about your outreach uh, to Portland uh, and Gresham and maybe Corbett. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that, uh, that, you, that you reached out and had conversations with Chief Flood, but if you could just maybe talk about uh, those conversations. Absolutely, Absolutely. yes. Um, so we, Deborah, or Chair Kapori and I met yesterday with um, uh, David, Flood from Corbett Fire District, and he was actually the one who suggested um, uh, extending the ban till October 15th. Um, he definitely um, encouraged us to work with the Corbett Fire District in Sovi Island when we consider these um, actions uh, in, in the future, as we did this time um, for this uh, extension. And um, Nathan in your office did a great job helping me reach out to the um, local juris the local cities, um, you know, and they are doing a variety of ac independent actions on their own, extending their own bands um, in different ways. I also talked to um, Scott Lewis, who is uh, works in the Gresham Fire Department and is also our representative on the Fire Defense Board. And we are talking with him about the potential for, you know, working with the state as a possible a possibility for future actions, um, rather than individual uh, communities having to take action. So that we're having conversations about whether that is is an act, is a, a route we might take. But we did reach out to, uh, and when I talked to um, Commissioner Hardesty's office and Deborah, uh, the chair, reached out to Chief Boone. So um, we've, we've reached out to a, a number of people. <laughs> Excellent. I, I so appreciate that. And, uh, you know, shout out to Chief Flood uh, for suggesting the October uh, timeline. Uh, and, and, yeah, I mean, I think obviously if it would have been helpful because individual cities are doing individual actions. Uh, and so it was very confusing. Uh, and if we had something at the state level, uh, I think that that would be better. Uh, but uh, Chair Kofori, thank you for your leadership on this. I think it's important and it was significant and it undoubtedly saved lives and property. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for bringing this forward and thank you, Liz, for all your work on this. Um, and Commissioner Stegman had answered my question about the outreach to the other jurisdictions and what that was like in more detail. So I really appreciate that answer. Um, and I'm and I'm glad to hear that um, you know that that there was support for this action. I think anytime we take these kinds of actions where we're limiting um, what's allowed and what people you know what people can do, um, it's it, we have to take that very seriously. But I think that also um, even more serious is the impacts 
of um, the fires like we saw with the Eagle Creek fire a few years ago and the fact that we have so much um, unincorporated land in, in Multnomah County that is um, at such risk of, of fire. Um, and we've already seen that this is an unprecedented um, season for fire. Um, and we're in and we're still, you know, we're, we're still in July. Um, I think that this is the right action to take. Um, the only question that I did have is what is the what is the enforcement or education around this going to look like? Um, because, you know, I think people were very hyper aware of it around the 4th of July when everybody's thinking about fireworks, but just curious as we, as we move in over the next few months, what that would look like. Yeah, this is an education forward um, enforcement effort. Um, it, it, this is not about arresting people or citing people really, unless it was really seriously in a, you know, you know, a serious violation where they're setting the forest on fire, literally. Um, uh, when we had conversations with the sheriff's office, when we did the initial uh, ban, they said that they would just, you know, let people know um, that 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 there was a ban and um, and just to bring, build awareness. All right, thank you, thank you. Um, I think that's you know that has worked um, fairly well with our wood smoke program too, like really trying to educate people about the dangers of this. Um, but agree that there's, you know, if it's egregious, then then there's more that's necessary. So again, thanks for your work on this, and I think that this is um, the smart thing to do and the right thing to do. Thank you, and Commissioner, I do I do want to clarify that um, the city of Troutdale uh, got, did get back to us, and they they were not. Um, they don't necessarily, it's not that they oppose this action, but they don't, didn't feel themselves that they needed to take action. So I just wanted to clarify that they didn't see it as an emergency issue. Okay, thank you for that. Commissioner Jayapo. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for bringing this forward. And Liz, thanks so much for your, for your work on it. Uh, it's absolutely the right thing to do. You know, I want to note that we're all paying attention to wildfire and uh, nationally we're paying attention to wildfire and fireworks also pose a risk in urban areas and want to mention that in my district uh, over the 4th of July weekend, we had a fire on North Wheedler in which two people died and it was caused by fireworks. So um, absolutely essential. I think that we continue to do this. Just one uh, question clarification, uh, it, it, the, you know, I'm. I, I think last time around, the city of Portland did its own ban. We're doing this one. Does it apply within Portland city limits? Our ban is only on an unincorporated uh, Multnomah County. Uh, the city of Portland has, uh, I believe, managed to tie their ban to a burn ban. I'm not sure exactly how they have logistically done that, but their ban has been extended is from my understanding from uh, Commissioner Hardesty's office. Great. Yeah, just wanted to clarify that for anyone who's listening. And again, thank you. Um, absolutely supportive. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Myron. Thank you. Um, I echo all my fellow commissioners' uh, comments here and appreciation. Um, and I, I do uh, particularly appreciate Commissioner Stegman's uh, question and comments regarding the state. I. I think that the best approach would be to have state leadership and direction in this area. Um, but in the absence of them taking this on, uh, I really appreciate that um, uh, that the county took this on and exercised that kind of leadership. Thank you, Chair Kafori. Thank you, Liz. Uh, this this did indeed undoubtedly, I feel, save lives. And hearing that number going down from was it 44 to 9, I think was the was the statistic, which is I, I mean, that. That is remarkable, so uh, I am really supportive and uh, and appreciate the work. Thank you all Marina. Would you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron. Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. And I would be remiss if I didn't give Liz Smith Curry a big thank you for all the work that she did on this. A lot of time spent and um, as, as a result now has many tours scheduled 
in uh, Corbett. Lots of time. With thank April. you. And I, I also want to thank Nathan uh, for his uh, help in D4. He he did help me quite a bit. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. All right, the resolution is adopted. R3, budget modification HD00322, appropriation of 4.2 million in States CARES Act funding to increase vac uh, vaccination rates. So moved. No. Second. Commissioner Jayapal Moose, Commissioner Vega Peterson seconds approval of R3. Good morning, Jessica Guernsey. Good morning. Um, I think I am joined by, sorry, Jessica Guernsey. I use she, her, her pronouns. Um, I'm the public health director at Multnomah County. And I think I am joined by um, Wendy Lear and possibly Adrian Daniels, who may be in commute. Um, you all are on, yes? Wendy, are you there? Maybe not. Okay. Let's get started. Uh, we have two budget modifications that we're bringing in front of you. Um, I referenced these um, in the briefing on Tuesday, um, and we have a little bit of a slide deck here that we can run through and, um, of course, answer any questions. Next slide, please. So the first um, budget modification, um, 003-22, is um, the $4.25 million in State CARES Act funding that I referenced on Tuesday for increasing vaccination rates and addressing vaccine disparities that are outlined in our health equity plan. Next slide. And then um, Commissioner Myron, I recall you asking some questions about um, the line items. So the next two slides will go over exactly what's in there. And Adrian, feel free to jump in where you um, where you want to here. Um, so, as we mentioned on Tuesday, this really supports the rollout of our um, gift card incentive program that um, started last week. Uh, additional temporary staffing for events to handle cash equivalents. Um, food for vaccine events where appropriate. Um, additional funding for community based organizations for their own events and incentives. And Adrian, do you want to touch on this 1, the school? Um, yes, thank you, Jessica. For the record, my name is Adrienne Daniels. I'm the Deputy Director of Integrated Clinical Services. Our clinics are working in close partnership with public health to provide COVID-19 vaccination access. And as part of this proposal, we are working to establish uh, a wider back-to-school events focusing on younger populations and their families who may have had further questions about receiving the COVID-19 vaccine while also offering an opportunity for youth who are returning to schools to access regular preventative care vaccines. There's been a recognition that with limited opportunities for in-person learning, we have many, many families in our community that have not received regular preventative vaccines. And so we're also hoping to promote education and awareness and the opportunity to not only receive the COVID-19 vaccine at some events, but additional preventative vaccines as well this fall. Thanks, Adrian. Next slide. So um, <clears throat> this is a breakout of the um, total amount. Um, so for right now we have um, 682,000 assigned to the um, uh, vaccine incentive clinics, um, 720,000 assigned for CBO vaccine incentive events, um, 500,000 for OHA partner vaccine events. Um, you may recall that um, OHA is already contracting with multiple community-based agencies um, that we would build off of to help support that. Um, one point, little bit over 1.1 million for the school based youth and family vaccine incentive clinics that Adrian just referred to. <clears throat> and then we're setting aside 1.2 million um, to hold to see how this works um, before we lean further into this strategy. I, I think you all know that at the last briefing, I mentioned that, um, you know, we are having to work for each and every vaccine that we get at this point for COVID-19, and we wanna measure the success of how this actually works before we commit additional funding to this strategy. Next slide. So again, this is a, a breakdown that you can see more clearly for line items, the actual uh, dollar amount, and then the percentage of the overall um, funding that totals 4.2 million. Next slide. Um, Chair Kafori, would you like me to stop there before the next bud mod or go forward? 
Uh, yeah, why, if you wouldn't mind stopping there so we can ask, uh, ask and answer questions. Um, okay, Commissioner Myron, do you have questions on SPUD mod number one? Yes, um, thank you. Um, and thank you, Jessica. I really appreciate the that further breakdown. And then um, I'm gonna ask if there is even further breakdown than that in terms of what is going to the, um, you know, the gift cards themselves versus sort of the, you know, staffing and other uh, sort of clinic capacity. Yes, we, I mean, we have a, a plan, a plan changes. So I'm sure we can provide that to you um, after this. Um, it is, it is our best estimate of staffing and incentive cards at this point. And like I said, we're doing um, a 2 week increment evaluation on how this is working um, and it may need to shift. So, um, Wendy, I think you're might have been able to unmute. If you want to chime in. Yeah, I think it's, it's the. Initially, it's a 1.1 million that's on that second slide is how much we've set aside for um, for the gift card incentives. But we can get you more detail beyond that um, because that's a little there's a portion that is dedicated to um, integrated clinical services and the, and the work that they're doing and then a portion that's um, dedicated to the public health events. Okay, I, I guess I'm just trying to get at how many, you know, rough estimate we anticipate and how many we would aspire to vaccinate um, at some of these events and uh, how many we might anticipate anticipate seeing. And I know obviously that's, that's hard to gauge, um, but do we have any kind of a number in mind uh, in terms of getting people vaccinated? Yeah, I'd be happy to pull those specific numbers for you after the meeting. Um, we created a formula based on our previous volume, which as you know, uh, we tried to hit a medium mark knowing that we were going on a downward trend. Um, again, I want to see how we perform for a few weeks um, before we land on like where we think we're actually going. Um, I, I want to remain positive that I think that this will help offset the cost of vaccination for folks and we'll see more people. Oh. That's great. Um, thanks so much. Sorry, mute. I now take the title of mutey. Commissioner Jayapal. Thanks, Chair. Thanks so much, uh, Jessica and Wendy. I have the same question as Commissioner Meyer and really about, you know, very generally how many how many people we expect to bring in through the incentive program. So would appreciate seeing that. Uh, no other questions, just a, just a comment to say that, you know, I appreciate the fact that we are sort of testing and then adjusting and testing and adjusting and setting aside the 1.2 or whatever that number was for for the future. Um, anecdotally, I, I, I was out in the Kenton neighborhood on Tuesday afternoon distributing flyers about the vaccine clinic and talking to people about the incentives. And I can tell you that every spot I went to, the incentives sparked incredible interest. And yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. I, I will also, I will temper that by saying the most common reaction was, darn, I already got my shot. But then right after that, when I said, but you get $50 if you take somebody in, there was a lot of excitement about that. So um, just appreciate the fact that that was included because I think that 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 could have some real impact as well. So thank you very much. No other questions. And I think uh, your comment, Commissioner, your anecdotal comment, Commissioner Jayapal, shows that getting the word out is important because people don't don't know about this. And so the more we can tell people inspires people to be creative. Commissioner Vicki Peterson. Thank you, Chair. No, actually, my questions were already um, answered, and I just wanted to say that I I also appreciate that you're setting money aside to see how this goes, to to see how um, um, effective that this the that these incentives are. I do think people are excited about them, um, so I am hopeful, like you are, that this will be um, impactful. But um, no other questions. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, thank you, Jessica and Adrian and, and Wendy. It's good to see you, Wendy. I don't get to see you uh, as often, uh, but I did have a couple of questions. So I know that uh, we talked about, and I thought I heard Jessica correct me if I'm wrong about the uh, the efficacy of some delivery systems, like whether it's door to door. And I thought I heard that that wasn't as productive. And I was just wondering if you can maybe talk a little bit about what you found are the best delivery systems. Do you mean delivery systems for vaccination? Okay. Um, <clears throat> no, what we're seeing right now is um, a pivot that we predicted around um, the uptake in our standing clinics because we're no longer in a scarcity environment. We're actually awash in vaccine and vaccine clinics. So you can go to a pharmacy, you can go to a healthcare system. We have our clinics. So we're looking at the environment and really um, looking at where is our niche. And one of our niches that has really been um, effective is the ability to have that hub and spoke model where we have a field team that's able to actually go out to example for like to a low income housing complex or an event right because a lot of it is about going to where people are um and some of that is um has to be nimble and organic so that's something that we're we're, we're really looking at folding in more of because there's so many places to go to a standing clinic right now as far as the outreach goes when we did this sort of soft launch of the incentive program, the weekend, I think it was the weekend before last, we had a team from the vaccine clinic go out to uh, La Pulga and do um, street outreach, just go out and talk to folks about, you know, we're out here today at Fabric Depot, um, we're providing vaccines, we just started a, a gift card program and we were able to bring people in. So they were, they were like, oh, wow, great. Um, I can, you know, jet over there and get vaccinated and um, that helps because it offsets some gas costs and whatever. So I, I think it's the coupling, like Tara Kapori was saying, like it, it's it's having that, but then the promotion um, of that, which you all are an integral part of. And I believe Nicole Buchanan shared um, our promotion materials with the board yes, or Tuesday after our board briefing. We have um, social media messages and flyers. Um, that we would love for you all to help promote. And thank you, Commissioner Jayapal, for going out in Kenton and reaching out to people. Because it is going to take that. It's going to take all of us to promote it. And, and what I did mention at the last meeting is that the state, and we met with them today, we're coordinating with them for what they're calling their ground game. They're hiring a um, well-known um, political canvassing firm um, that has done groundbreaking work in Georgia um, to help with... Uh, a uh, very, very specific census track level outreach um, to promote uh, our vaccine clinics um, and other vaccine clinics. So we're really excited to bring that on board because that's where we're at. We need to do that level of outreach. And did that answer your question? Yeah, that that's great, Jessica. Thank you so much for going more into depth. Uh, and I know that uh, the the chair and I are going to have an opportunity to be in Rockwood uh, this evening at the, they have like a farmers market. Uh, and then I know also Portland uh, has uh, my people's market. And I think it's like the first weekend in August. You probably are aware of it, uh, but the, uh, that's just a suggestion uh, if you you know want to reach the, the black and African-American community, because it's a market specific uh, for that population, uh, for those vendors that are um, um, minority owned businesses. So uh, anyway, I think you're, you're doing a great job and I really appreciate uh, you really being um, really in business, you know, you're, you're targeting, you're segmenting the market and you're targeting your audience and trying to really figure out, you know, what is going to get you the biggest bang for the buck. Uh, and clearly you've, you've thought through uh, what that strategy should be. Uh, and then you're circling back and reevaluating it. So I really appreciate you, you really delving down uh, into kind of the science of how to best get the word out and get folks vaccinated. Thank you. And Marina, did we receive any um, public comment on this item? No, Madam Chair. And Jessica, I'm assuming you have no other issues to talk about on this item. Um, the vaccine parity, your next piece is on the next budget modification. Great. Marina, would you please take a roll call vote? I apologize, uh, the screen took over. Uh, Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kofori? Aye. The budget modification is approved.
R4, budget modification HD 00422, appropriation of 1.9 million in CDC funding to address COVID-19 health and social disparities. So moved. Second. Commissioner Stegman moves, Commissioner Vega-Peterson seconds, approval of R4. We could pull the slides back up again, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so this is Jessica Guernsey again. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to introduce myself again. Um, yes, you, you can, can you go back to... one slide, please? Oh. There you go. Welcome, Jessica Guernsey. Thank you. Andy Lear. Okay. When did you want me to go ahead? Okay. Um, again, I, I mentioned this uh, yesterday in my presentation with my last slide, which you all know is my constant um, challenge to try and create a visual that helps explain all these different concepts and funding streams. So this is for Bud Mud um, HD 004-22, um, $4 million over two years um, for COVID-19 and other health and social disparities. Um, the first segment of this grant um, is for 1.87 million dollars for fiscal year 22, um, and then uh, the the rest of the money rolls over into the next year. Next slide. Um, so, as I mentioned yesterday, this is really exciting funding from um, the CDC um, from this uh, from the Biden and Harris administration. Um, directing um, uh, urban jurisdictions um, to begin to work on um, really interweaving the concepts of COVID-19 prevention and chronic disease um, prevention. As you all have heard me many times, um, these are, um, you know, dueling pandemics, if you will, and we have to address both. So um, this grant will help support um, more of the infrastructure um, that is needed in a modernized public health system. I, I compare this to the state public health modernization funding um, in that it helps us build that workforce development and capacity both internally and externally um, to address both acute and um, chronic health disparities, um, really looking at COVID-19 to begin with. So this funding will be used to update and expand our COVID-19 um, BIPOC framework and plan um, to support communities at risk, um, mostly through, as I talked about on Tuesday, our work with health literacy. So it's a very strong focus on how we're building our capacity internally and externally to focus on health literacy, understanding that that is at the crux of much of the work that we do, whether it's around COVID-19 or something else. Next slide, please. So just in more detail, um, we will be um, using this funding to mobilize partners and collaborators to advance our overarching health equity um, strategy and address social determinants of health. Um, as I said, beginning with COVID-19, unfortunately, we're still grappling with this and need to address um, those um, vaccine gaps and also underlying health conditions that have led to disproportionate hospitalizations um, that I know that Chair and um, Commissioner Stegman will be talking about today out in Rockwood. Um, so, again, we will be implementing a health literacy communi communications for diverse audiences, as well as working with um, community partners that have been an integral part of the COVID-19 response, um, as well as our regular public health work um, to build their capacity um, to disseminate scientifically accurate, culturally and linguistic responsive information. Next slide. I think that's it. Oh, okay. I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Stegman, do you have questions on this? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I don't know, Jessica, do you have, um, you, this is kind of the what, I was wondering if you have the how yet determined and, and maybe you're not that far uh, about like what the action items are around health literacy or has that been flushed out yet? Actually, this is a really well-timed question. We're meeting with the work plan team today to start to detail out the work plan. Um, so we'd be happy to come back to, to report back. Some of this work obviously um, necessitates immediate partner engagement before we get too far down a work plan. So that's on the front end of what we're doing, but I'd be 
happy to come back with um, other folks from the public health division to talk about the, the developing work plan. Excellent, that'd be great. Thank you. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, I think that this, um, I was just thinking, Jessica, that, um, you know, this budget, budget modification, the last one we did, I mean, it's really great because these are, this is money that we hadn't anticipated or included in the budget, right? These are new things, but I just think that you, your whole team has been so busy the last 18 months. And even though this is like really great um, resources and, and, as, and I'm especially with um, this one funding the work around doing outreach and, um, and raising um, health literacy and looking at the social determinants of health. Like, I think all of these are such great things. I was just thinking like, but, but there's like, you know, there's so much work to do and you've got the resources, but it's still a lot of work for your team. So no questions. I was just thinking that um, I just really appreciate everything that the public health team is doing around this stuff. Thank you, Commissioner Vega Peterson. We appreciate that acknowledgement. Commissioner Jaffa. Thanks, Chair, and thanks again, Jessica. Um, I just think this is really great. It, it's a chance to, it seems like a chance to consolidate lessons learned over the past uh, 15 or so months. Um, so that's really exciting. I guess just one uh, very general, and I'm looking forward to the work plan as well. General question, when you talk about infrastructure, is that is that people, is that is that workforce people? To yeah, work? it is more people to to Commissioner Vega Peterson's point. Um, we, we need more bodies um, yeah. to actually do this work. It's also external funding for um, capacity building within community based agencies, which has been a theme from the public health division for the last several years. And I'm excited to see that in the public health modernization funding, there's a parallel stream of thinking that will really pull out funding, understanding that CBOs are a part of the public health system. And what we've seen in COVID is we can't expect them to ramp up this fast and then ramp down. We need to keep them at a certain level because just like us, if you reduce that and it goes away, you can't build it back in two months. So that's a big part of what we're going to be doing is making sure that's their that's the parallel kind of capacity path external. That's great. Thank you. Commissioner Myron. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't have any additional questions. I just want to um, also. Uh, add how excited I am for this opportunity I, that, um, as you described, we're not just able to um, to apply to COVID and what's happening now, but we can apply, can be effective uh, in terms of promoting our overarching sort of health equity strategy uh, for and for underlying conditions um, and for all of the work we do and all of our sort of future aspirations and and uh, what our priorities are. So really super exciting uh, foundational work and uh, I look forward to seeing the work plan as well. Marina, did we receive any public testimony on this item? No, Madam Chair. Will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jaipal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The budget modification is approved. R5 Budget Modification NON D 00122 appropriates. 5.05 million in States Care Act funds for small business relief and fund 1515. So moved. Second. second. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Myron seconds. Approval of R5. Good morning, uh, Chair Kafori um, and commissioners. Can you hear me okay? My name is John Vashatinsky. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm joining you today, not in my role as a sustainability director, but in, in my role as the chair's um, economic relief and recovery coordinator uh, for COVID-19. And I'm pleased to be here today with uh, my colleague Christian um, to talk about this budget, mo mo budget modification. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about where we are in the economic recovery here in Multnomah County. 
uh, talk a bit about our first round of CARES Act um, business relief grants um, that were uh, executed in FY 2021 and then look at uh, look ahead um, to this current uh, budget modification and the um, grant process that we would like to roll out in FY 2022 uh, with this additional uh, CARES Act funding from the state. So um, next slide, please. So, um, you know, I think we can all uh, remember uh, the frightening period, um, not only uh, frightening in the sense that we were um, encountering this novel virus, but also the uh, steep drop in employment. And one of the sectors that was, of course, um, hardest hit was the leisure and hospitality sector. And while there's certainly been job recovery in this sector, um, we can see from this graph that uh, it's still far below where we were prior to the pandemic. Um, so we still have a ways to go um, in this sector, and I think you know in many sectors across the economy um, before we reach pre-pandemic uh, employment levels. Next slide, please. Uh, we also know um, from the data that um, the uh, rate of employment recovery between different um, racial groups is uneven. It was uneven before the pandemic and it continues to be uneven after the pandemic, not even exasperated by the pandemic. So um, the red line here, for example, is black or African-American uh, 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 people in um, Oregon um, and these, uh, and you can see that their uh, rate of unemployment is substantially higher than 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 white um, than the white population. Uh, next slide, please. Um, all right, so I'm gonna, and then uh, here on this slide, we can look at how um, funding has been distributed. And we're gonna look at it sort of geographically first and then um, look at it uh, through a, a, a racial and ethnic disparities lens. Um, so in this first slide, we can see that uh, for PPP loans, um, they were sort of unevenly distributed uh, with the vast majority um, of these uh, funds going to the city, to businesses in the city of Portland. Um, I just wanted Jeff Renfro, who, who provided these data for me, would be uh, upset if I didn't caveat this heavily to say that these data are super messy and um, this isn't sort of a, a, I wouldn't look at this as sort of a definitive um, inventory of PPP loans, um, but uh, just to sort of look at those percentages and to get a sense for how how those PPP loans have been distributed um, geographically here in Multnomah County. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the as I mentioned in the previous slide, the data for um, the PPP loans is pretty messy. It's that that includes sort of the the race and ethnicity data, um, but we know from uh, this Brookings report that came out highlighted the disparities, the racial disparities. Uh, in access to PPP loans, um, and so we know that there there have been um, you know uh, disparities in in the ability of uh, black and minority owned business owner uh, business owners to get access to this funding, and that's a disparity, of course, that precedes the pandemic, um, but is uh, carried over into this particular pool of relief funding. Next slide, please. So uh, we these are trend these are these are sort of current trends, but um, the, they're 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 not new trends. Um, and so we 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 had sort of a similar look before um, in November of uh, twenty uh, of twenty twenty. Um, the governor announced um, funding for counties uh, for business relief. Um, that was CARES Act funding at the time. And uh, if we can bring ourselves into the way back machine and remember um, the end of the year in 2020, although maybe we don't want to, but um, that at that time um, we weren't we were operating in the assumption that we had to expend all CARES Act funding by the end of the calendar year, so December 31st, uh, 2020. So that was uh, uh, gave us quite a short window um, to. Um, uh, kind of operate in in order to to get these funds out out the door um i'm i'm happy to report that we did get them out the door um and uh if you can go to the next slide please 
um, we can get a little bit of a, a breakdown um, of, 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 of how those, those funds uh, went out. And so you can see we, we really did uh, try to work with culturally specific providers in order to make sure that um, these loans, or sorry, these grants could um, get into the hands of um, business owners in specific uh, communities. Um, but we also um, took a more uh, blanket approach, uh, giving money to uh, restaurants and food carts, um, which had been so impacted by COVID restrictions um, through the environmental health team. Um, and so that we actually made funding available for, for all licensed um, food carts. Um, and so that was, uh, uh, you know, uh, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about that particular pot of funding in a second. Um, we also um, were cognizant of the of a disparity um, in terms of CARES Act distribution in East County. And thanks to work with Commissioner Stegman and, and her staff, uh, we were able to uh, partner with the uh, PBA Charitable Institute um, to set aside some funding specifically for East County. And then, as I mentioned, we worked with some of these other um, culture specific chambers um, and other organizations. Um, these were uh, th those uh, culture specific chambers and um, Apano and Nea. Um, they had also worked with Prosper Portland um, in order to um, uh, give out previous rounds of grants. And that turned out to be a really big uh, boon for the county because uh, not only did those organizations have systems in place to, to give grants, they had actually gone out and had more uh, grant applicants than they had funding from the city of Portland. So we were able to kind of backfill um, those funding, uh, you know, backfill that um, that dearth of, of funding that they had um, and, and get the money out really quickly. Ob obviously, we were, we were operating in a really, really tight timelines. Uh, next slide, please. So um, here's a, um, a sort of a, a graphic that shows you um, not perfectly, but 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 kind of uh, pretty good um, where uh, those grants went to um, and for restaurants and mobile units or, or food carts. Um, and if we were to layer in, so there was a, there was a, um, I'm, I'm going to blank on the, it's like 2800 grants approximately um, that were made. We have about 3,300 restaurants in our system and our license system and about 900 mobile units. So we didn't quite reach all of them, um, but we did reach a substantial percentage. Um, and if we were to layer in those, those restaurants um, and mobile units that we did not reach, it, the distribution would look roughly the same with sort of a lot of concentration around those commercial corridors um, and, and less um, distribution elsewhere. Um, Okay, next uh, slide, please. Uh, so these are sort of um, our approaches and principles. I think they're, they're pretty familiar to the board members um, at this point. Um, and uh, just in the effort of, uh, of time, um, can you um, advance the slide, please? Uh, so yeah, we had uh, kind of using that same system that we uh, we got back in November, December of 20. 20. Uh, we have this new round of funding by a little bit more than five million dollars. Um, and then here you see some of the um, uh, funding uh, stipulations from the state. I think one of the, the one I really want to highlight on this slide is that 5% administrative cost cap. Um, and that we, we were able to kind of um, uh, operate under that cap last time by um, not charging administrative costs for the funds that were directly uh, granted out by the by the county. However, um, uh, this time around, as you'll see on the next slide, please. Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> I'll, I'll get to it in a second. But this time around, we're, we're, we're going to have to, um, we're, we're hoping that the board will appropriate um, some um, uh, uh, contingency funds um, to help um, our providers reach a 10% administrative cap, which is pretty standard with county contracts. Um, all right, next slide, please. All right, so taking um, all uh, available information um, into account, uh, we are proposing on this round that uh, we direct uh, the grants through our providers um, to um, small businesses with an emphasis on East County businesses and minority owned businesses. 
um, with for things like commercial rent relief, um, business support and technical assistance. So this could, you know, be anything from you know website development to uh, moving, you know, better outdoor seating or whatnot, and loan forgiveness. Um, next slide, please. Uh, here's a breakdown of the um, uh, providers we would like to work with and the and the funding amounts that we would like to allocate to those um, providers. Um, and yeah, you can see that we've added some new providers this time around, and there's also some providers that we worked with in the previous in the first round of funding. Um, I'm really excited to have the Hispanic Metropolitan Chamber and Hacienda CDC um, added to the list, especially because of their uh, reach into the Latinx uh, population. Uh, next slide, please. I think this is for Christian. Good morning, Chair Board. Christian Elkin, Budget Director. I use she, her pronouns. Um, this is just a quick summary of the actual actions that you'll be approving today. So first, the state you would be appropriating the $5.05 million from the state with uh, the 5% program administration cap and then 95% of the funds being distributed to businesses. Um, I would, I'd like to highlight kind of this piece that John just talked to you about, about the uh, request for general fund contingency funds. I think while we, you know, really appreciate the state's commitment to ensure that as many dollars as possible are going directly into the business relief programs, the 5% admin cap for barriers and burdens for our community partners. So in an effort to minimize those barriers, the county needed to recognize that the work that we're asking um, these groups to partner with us on oftentimes is going beyond the normal scope of their, of their traditional work. And we know that that administrative infrastructure is already strained based on the response to COVID and the partnerships that we're asking them to engage in. Also, we, we understand that, you know, when we apply that, that equity lens, that we don't want to further burden these organizations that the county is entrusting to perform outreach to the hardest reach communities and communities that have been hit hardest by the pandemic. And so what we're asking today is that we appropriate $205,000 from the general fund contingency. We had an earmarked a line of $1 million in general fund contingency to mitigate and address COVID-19. This was in addition to our standard contingency, so it wouldn't reduce our standard contingency. And this would then allow us to, um, to send 10% program administration to each of those organizations that will help us push these grants out to those hardest hit communities and hardest to reach communities. Um, so, uh, and as John mentioned, this does align with kind of the county standard practice for when we um, appropriate general fund through contracts to our community partners. So I think that ends our presentation and uh, we're happy to answer any questions that the board may have. Thank you, John and Christian. Um, Marina, did we receive any public comment on this item? No, Madam Chair. Right. Uh, Commissioner Myron, questions, comments. Thank you. Um, I had uh, one um, a, a question and a comment, and I was just curious uh, if to what degree um, the, the there's so many minority-owned businesses in downtown, Old Town, um, Chinatown areas, and um, and how those might be impacted by these. I know there's a focus on East County businesses and I'm wondering um, what kind of focus there's been on, on that group of businesses. Yeah. Th thank you, Commissioner Myron. Um, what, one of the good things about this round of funding is that we are not the only game in town, um, whether it's East County or um, Portland. Uh, so the Prosper Portland will also be issuing uh, funding um, through their allocations of ARPA money. Um, and then the, uh, as, <clears throat> excuse me, as we know, this, this round of ARPA money was more equitable um, and also hitting those East County uh, jurisdictions as well. So um, we are maybe the first out of the gate when it comes to um, putting additional funds on the street um, for businesses, but um, we won't be the last. Great. Um... 
Thank you. Um, and I, it, the other thing I wanted to bring up is just, you know, a comment and really underscore one sector that uh, my office had raised pretty early on in the process is faith institutions. And I've heard from several mosques um, in my district and also across the county that paying rent and utilities on their buildings has become really challenging during the pandemic. You know, they rely so heavily on member donations for revenue and uh, and dues and have received fewer donations as people have visited the mosques in person this year. So these are, you know, such valuable social and community hubs and they've played an important convening and public health role and connection during the pandemic. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping if there's a possible avenue to support them in keeping their doors open and um, allowing them to, you know, bring back their com their their communities and their congregations and serve as those hubs. I'm hopeful that this assistance can do it. Um, and so I I just wanted to raise that and um, if you had any any thoughts or clarification on them and the ability to be eligible for these funds. Um, uh, Commissioner uh, Myron, the uh, CARES Act funds are uh, uh, can be used for 501c3s. Uh, so it's going to so depend a little bit on their tax status. Um, we're going to be working with those culturally specific providers. Um, and I sort of highlighted some of our major um, obligations uh, from the state contract and, um, you know, target um, areas. Um, but that's something that's a conversation we can certainly continue to have and, and see if there's any, any of those providers are, are capable of reaching into those um, uh, specific areas. That would be that would be great. Thank you. No more questions. Commissioner Jayapal. Thanks, Chair. Thank you so much, John. Um, thank you for taking this on on top of your your day job. It it has <laughs> obviously been a lot. Really appreciate it. Um, and I appreciate the information about the last round of funding. That was something I was curious about in terms of geographic distribution as well as race and ethnicity. And so it was good to start start getting that information out. Um, one quick question related to your point that we're not the only game in town. So are are the various games in town um, coordinating? And you know what I'm wondering is, for example, if Prosper has another round of funding coming, I'm assuming there's mechanisms in the application to make sure that it isn't the same folks getting resources from multiple places. Yeah, thank you, um, uh, Commissioner Chaipal. Um, the uh, we are closely collaborating. So, so as you mentioned, my duties um, in, in this role uh, include collaboration with other jurisdictions, and probably the closest um, collaboration has been with uh, Prosper Portland, um, and they've been graciously invited me to their um, ARPA funding um, uh, coordinating council. <laughs> I guess I'm sorry, I'm thinking on the exact on the exact name of it. Um, so we're definitely um, thinking thinking about that that kind of collaboration and how we can leverage each other's um, investments. Um, we, I think those those systems around you know I, I guess the double dip if uh, sort so to speak um, is going you know that's a good that's a good flag for for me to make sure that in our application process for these funds as we kind of pass those obligations through to the to the providers that we were asking um, uh, them about that double dip and kind of making sure that we're um, staying uh, in the on the right side of the the rules that have been issued by the Treasury Department in terms of like the uh, level of scrutiny we have to apply in order to make sure sure that unpermissible uses or, or excess uses of these funds are not being are not being um, uh, done. I think there's also sort of a matter of fairness. So 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 even if it's permitted, it might not be fair for one business to kind of uh, game the system, so to speak, and you know you know you know go 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 from one bull to the next, I guess, at the party. Um, so the the 
yeah, that's something that um, I'll, I'll have to kind of dig in with with our CFO and, and kind of try to understand a little bit more about, you know, one is what are what are obligations, um, legally speaking, and then um, to like, how do we uh, build in these these safeguards? Um, so, so that's something that we can we'll definitely work on more. That's great. Appreciate that. And, you know, I, I don't know that I was thinking so much about folks gaming the system. There's so much need out there that it's understandable that everyone's trying to get what they can. It's just that what ends up happening is that the better situated, better resourced, larger, you know, you name it, organizations end up having more access. So I think I was yeah, thinking yeah. more in terms of that fairness lens. So I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah. Um, and then just a couple of comments. One is I really appreciate setting aside the additional 5% because uh, 5% for admin costs is not sufficient um, for, for most of these organizations. So I'm very supportive of that. I also appreciate adding MISO to our list of partners. They're not someone we've worked with in the past. And I think that they do a really good job of reaching tiny, tiny enterprises that are predominantly women, predominantly people of color, and predominantly immigrants and refugees. So I'm, I'm glad to see them added to the list. So yeah, thank you thank so you. much for the work. Thank yeah. you, Commissioner Jaipal, for making that connection. Thanks. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, John, for all your work on this. And I hope that, I mean, it's, I know you've been very busy with this for the last um, year or so, but, you know, just how interesting to get involved into this and, and really working um, with delivering the dollars to these businesses so much. Um, I, so I hope we've enjoyed it. Um, so I would say um, I'm really glad to see both um, the Hispanic Metropolitan Chamber included in this as well as Hacienda CC, CDC to be able to target um, more effectively, I think, to the Latinx community and the Latinx businesses. Um, I was, um, you know, disappointed last time that they weren't included in, in that list because I know that, that we have many um, Latinx um, small businesses who really suffered during COVID. So I'm glad that we have um, two partners on board now for that. And um, I know that they have a lot of ties to the community. So I think that'll be really effective. I did have a question about the FY21 um, funding that was um, that was um, handled by the Portland Business Alliance and, and targeted to East County cities or East County businesses. Do we have any additional breakdown though in terms of the businesses that they worked with and and if there were further demographics, you know, demographic information for those businesses? I would I would be interested in seeing that. Uh, thank you. Um, Commissioner, so so I just want to make clear that um, during the first round, we did uh, ask um, the Hispanic Metropolitan Chamber and the um, Hacienda CDC to um, be disbursement partners um, in our work. And unfortunately, they just were, you know, we, we were asking them in November 2020 after a very long year of um, doing a lot of work and, and th they were they were not able to for for a couple of technical reasons that I can get into participate with us. So we, we were disappointed as well. Um, I just want to make sure that that um, I express that. In terms of the um, uh, PBA um, uh, Charitable Institute and their work in East County, we do have a uh, breakdown of uh, the demographics that they that they reached. Um, they clearly were able to get a, a lot of um, grants, over 400 grants, to East County businesses, and um, we do have a detailed breakdown of, of those. Um, I've I've been working on a on a sort of comprehensive um, breakdown between all our providers um, of, on a sort of demographic and um, on a, with with demographic data. It's been a little bit tricky kind of getting getting all the reports into a single into, into the same format with the same coding and everything. So it's taking me a little longer than I than I hoped it would. But um, that's uh, that's we, we have that breakout um, for PBA um, that I can share with you immediately um, uh, once I'm sort of emailing again and not talking. OK, thank you. I appreciate that. And I do remember you're saying when we were approving this, I think the, the first time around for FY21 that you said that they, I think it was that the chamber metropolitan chamber wouldn't wasn't able to be a partner at the time. And, I would, and it was just disappointing. So I, that's what yeah. I'm glad it is. I don't want to mean that you didn't do outreach because I know that that absolutely happened. So I appreciate that a lot. Um, and then I just also wanted to add that I am uh, very supportive of us giving the additional contingency funds to get um, our, our partners up to that 10% administration fee. I think we hear, I think there's always that balance between wanting not to have too much administration overhead, but also realizing we want our partners to be able to fulfill their duties and to pay living wages and to do all of those other things as we're asking them to do these programs. So I think this is a really important um, addition that we're, we're giving on to the, to the state dollars. 
Um, that's great. And then, oh, I did have one last question, and this might be, if you need to, well, this might be more for Christian anyway. I know that there was some question about the timing of getting some of the, um, looking at how the state dollars and the city dollars had been spent or for the city specifically in terms of um, how their CARES Act dollars had been spent. And they were, we're I, I haven't heard that that has been a problem for the county at all, and I just wanted to confirm that. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, yeah, we are, I'm working with Eric's office right now for year end close. We're evaluating all of the spend down for the CARES Act. We don't anticipate that we will have uh, any underspending going into the next fiscal year, except for we did identify right at the end of the budget process, $2 million of underspending for the health department because they had gotten um, some, some funding that they weren't expecting that also had some time delimination on it, so they were swapping funds. But beyond that, um, we will fully spend out uh, that, that CARES Act funding and, as you, and our, the partner funding that we received from the city of Portland. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much, Christian, and just really good work for everybody and all the department budget folks too who are working to make sure that all that happened. Thank you. Commissioner Stegman? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John and Christian. Uh, yes, absolutely support the 10% admin funding and, and thank you for thinking about that and how important that is uh, to our CBOs and partners. Um, John, I did have a couple of questions and also wanted to really thank you uh, for your incredible work on the East County grants. Uh, if, if you weren't working on it closely, you may not have noticed how quickly and efficiently that money was distributed. Uh, and, and one of the reasons I think that was so successful is because we were able to go and look at our restaurant licenses. And so that's leading me to the my question now. While um, I guess my concern is that if you're connected, you may belong to a chamber, uh, culturally specific or otherwise, but a lot of small businesses don't even have that capacity. I'm wondering, is there some type of licensing at the state level, or is there another way that we can look at that data and those small businesses and identify them? Thank you, Thank you. Um, Commissioner Stegman. So, yeah, I think so. That's a great question. Um, one requirement from the state is that all uh, el that all businesses receiving um, funding. Uh, from us um, be licensed with with the state with the secretary of state's office. Um, so that's and that we could look at those data. I think you're you're flagging a, an important issue that uh, once the approval by the board is completed and we pivot into contracting with our uh, providers um, is all it's kind of on a parallel track t talking you know about um, getting the word out. Um, you know obviously through 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 multiple channels and so. Um, that's a, that's a good area for us to explore to see if we can leverage um, the Secretary of State's office, the business licensing. Uh, we can certainly also um, leverage uh, the licensing that we have through environmental health um, to get the word out as well. And that's something that we did um, heavily uh, the last round, but but kind of making it known that there's this new round of funding um, through those through those licensed businesses is a, is a great idea as well. Great, thank you so much, John. And just also wanted to highlight uh, the commercial rent relief. Um, is have we done that type of grant funding or is this the first time we've been able to do that the last round of funding was a little bit not very specific in how they would use those funds um it had to be tied to a loss due to covid um a loss of revenue due to covid um or an increased expenditure due to covid um, and so, and that will continue to be true in this round because it's still CARES Act funding. Um, and so, you know, uh, that um, commercial, you know, it, so they could have certainly applied those funds to commercial rent, to, to, to their commercial rents. Um, however, um, this is something that some of our providers have flagged specifically this time around as wanting to tackle. Uh, the state has a commercial rent relief program, but uh, unfortunately, you have to have a willing landlord. You have to kind of apply. You have to apply with your landlord to to, to be eligible for that assistance. And you know, we know that you know uh, most landlords are fine, enough standing people who want to work with their um, uh, tenants to to be successful. But that's not always the case. And so, if your landlord is kind of um, 
digging in their heels, then um, you might not be able to get that assistance. Um, so we're, we're hopeful that um, these dollars can be put, put to use in that way as, uh, this time around. Um, but um, in general, we like to take a sort of flexible approach because the business owners themselves are, you know, going to know the best, the, their highest and best need um, for for the use of the, the grant grant funding. That that's great. Well, I'm really glad to see more of an expansion. Uh, and are there outreach efforts to work with uh, commercial landlords to educate them? Uh, so that I mean, because sometimes you know, as a small business, you may or may not know about this program. Uh, and if we can kind of attack it from both sides. Yeah, this uh, is this the state program you're referring to, Commissioner? Uh, well, state or local. I mean, I'm just wondering, like, if we have a local business and they're not able to pay their their lease and they're like i don't know what to do uh and they call their landlord and if the landlord has this knowledge oh well you know you maybe you should apply for this right um yes uh that's a good that's a good point and that's something as we develop our outreach strategy i think that's a really good uh, really good thing to add in there all right very good well i appreciate all the work that you're doing john above and beyond your your normal duties uh thank you so much for stepping up it's my honor thank you I can't remember if I asked this already, Marina, but did we receive any public testimony on this item? No, Madam Chair. All right. Um, before we take our votes, I just want to add my um, thank you to John Vashatinsky and Nicole Buchanan, who have been working in addition to all the other things that they're doing, working really hard on this, um, this issue and Nicole, who worked so hard on the vaccine parity dollars as well. Um, and with that, Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The budget modification is approved. And before we jump into R6, I just want to give everyone a time check that we are. Uh, uh, slightly, if not very much behind schedule this morning. So we still have 6 more items to go. Um, just note, it's 1115. All right. What's next Marina? R6 public hearing and 1st reading of ordinance amending MCC chapter 12 business income tax to reflect changes made by the city of Portland in recent years and certain technical changes. So moved. 2nd. Commissioner Jayapal moves. Commissioner Vega Peterson seconds. Approval of R6. Good morning, Chair Kafori and Commissioners. Uh, Eric Ariano, Chief Financial Officer. And I'm hoping the next two items will be really quick. Uh, they're just kind of housekeeping items. Um, and so the request today is the first, the first one is the first reading on the ordinance amending um, chapter 12, which is our business income tax code. Um, I've, I've shared this in the past, but um, the county and the city of Portland work really closely on our tax codes for the business license tax for the city and the county's business income tax to make sure that we maintain um, some level of conformity with our tax codes. And a part of that that partnership is that if there's any um, proposed changes is that we communicate amongst each other. And so what we do on an annual basis to make sure that if there's any differences um, that we, we uh, uh, align those where it makes sense to align those. And so this request before you today is to do that housekeeping and essentially align the codes for um, this next tax year. And so there's there's three main changes and I, I would really call them, they're more housekeeping, housekeeping than substantive changes. Um, the first one is to re remove uh, reference or definitions around joint ventures or tenants in common. And the reason why um, we're making that modification is that the, the city's new tax system um, uh, cannot accommodate for that setup. And so what we're simply doing is just removing those references and it will really require um, those entities that fall into a joint venture or a tenant in common that they'll have to file individual returns rather than pulling them together in one account. So for all intended purposes, it's just a change in process. And then we're accommodating the, the, the language in our code to reflect that change. Um, the second piece is um, we're updating a, a reference to a Oregon administrative rule um, around um, frivolous filing. So there's really no change to what that section has. 
it's more just referencing uh, uh, Oregon administrative rule um, number. And the, the final change um, is that um, two years ago, it seems like a long time now, but uh, when we increased the tax rate for our business income tax, we also increased the owner's compensation deduction up to $127,000. And that had been historically indexed on an annual basis. But when we made the actual code changes, we uh, failed to incorporate that continued um, intent to, to adjust that by CPI or index it on an annual basis. And so um, we made that modification, which was our original intent. We just missed it. And so that's being corrected for um, the current tax year, 2021. Um, so it has no impact on um, revenues. We always and we always intended to do that. Um, we just accidentally missed that. So uh, those are on, the only three changes being proposed with this uh, first reading. Obviously, we're going to have a second reading in the near future. Um, so I'll open up for any questions or comments. Thanks, Eric. And I'm assuming that Will is on the line to answer legal yep. questions yep. if we those arise. Marina, do we receive any public testimony in this item? No, Madam Chair. No. Wonderful. Commissioner Stegman, questions, comments? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Eric. Just a quick question. The uh, OAR citation for frivolous positions. What, is, what does that mean? Frivolous positions. F frivolous filing. And so if, uh, if a tax filer submits forms that are purposely um, incorrect or misleading, um, there's a fine of $500, a potential fine of $500. Um, yeah. No other questions. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Eric. I don't have any questions. Commissioner Jayapal. Thanks, Eric. No questions. Commissioner Myron. Thank you, Eric. No questions. All right, Marina, would you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron. Aye. Commissioner Jaipal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kapori? Aye. The first reading is approved, and the second reading will be on September the 2nd. R7 Public Hearing and First Reading of Ordinance Amending MCC Chapter 11. Preschool for all program income tax to reflect a technical change. So moved. Second. Commissioner Myron moves. Commissioner Vega Peterson seconds. Approval of R7. Uh, for the record, again, uh, Eric Ariano, Chief Financial Officer, and this is the first reading for. Uh, an ordinance amending uh, chapter 11 and specifically uh, updating the section in chapter 11 for the preschool for all uh, tax code. And uh, back in January of two, uh, January 28th is the date, um, the board approved the new tax code for uh, preschool for all. Um, and in that we had a section specifically 1111518 around tax exemptions. And that language in there originally had um, that income derived from Oregon pension was um, not subject to tax or essentially exempt from the tax, but it did not exempt um, pensions from federal programs, pension programs. And so under ta uh, uh, tax law, we are required to exempt uh, federal pension income as well. And so this change just modifies that language or enhances that language to incorporate uh, not just um, those exemptions that are from state law, but also federal law. And so uh, this makes that correction and puts it in, in alignment with um, requirements, both at the state and federal level for uh, personal income tax. So um, that's the only change being proposed with the preschool fraud tax with this first reading. So I'll open up for any questions. Thanks, Eric. Marina, did we receive any public comment on this item? No, Madam Chair. All right. Uh, does anyone have a question, comment, Commissioner Myron? No. Commissioner Jayapal? Nope. Commissioner Vega Peterson? No questions. And Commissioner Stegman? No questions. All right. Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? 
Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Capori? Aye. The first reading is approved and the second reading will be on September the 2nd. And we will now recess as the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners and convene as the Hospital Facilities Authority of Multnomah County. R8, resolution authorizing the issuance of revenue bonds in one or more series, series 2021 to Williger Plaza uh, Parkview expansion by the Hospital Facilities Authority of Portland, of Multnomah County, Oregon. So moved. Second. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Stegman seconds approval of R8. So good morning again, uh, Eric Ariano, Chief Financial Officer. And with me, I have um, Bob Johnson, President and CEO of Twitter Plaza. And I believe Jody O'Donnell, CFO at Twitter Plaza. And then um, Greg Blond with um, ORIC, uh, which is the county's bond council for uh, conduit debt. So what I thought we would do for this uh, specific agenda item is I would start with giving kind of a, a brief uh, high level overview of the specific request. The purpose and um, our authority under our county's hospital facilities authority talk a little bit about the process um, and some other considerations. Then I'll pass it over to Bob Johnson to actually talk about in more depth about the request of this specific um, debt issue. So, um, so starting off is this specific request is to authorize um, a conduit debt financing, which would be uh, revenue bonds, tax exempt bonds uh, for on behalf of Twilliger Plaza for the Parkview expansion project in the amount not to exceed $175 million. Um, and if, if you approve this today is the timeline is that these bonds would be issued um, in early September um, timeframe. Um, the specific purpose is to for the again for the Parkview expansion project, but the financing will will fund the design, construction, improvement, and furnishing and equipping of a new facility um, that's currently a, on a parcel of land that's adjacent to the current uh, Twilliger Plaza facility. Um, the project is estimated to cost just under 150 million dollars for this new facility. Um, there also is an incorporation in this financing that we're going to essentially refinance uh, a previous um, bank direct bank placement loan in the amount of $25 million uh, back in, um, I believe, August of 2019. Our county uh, hospital facilities board approved uh, of a financing for pre development costs for this specific project in the amount of $25 million. So this bigger issue would essentially refund or refinance, sorry, um, that initial initial 25 million um, that was financed uh, for pre-development costs. And um, in terms of who, you know, who Twilliger Plaza is, I'll let Bob Johnson guide, give more specifics on that, but just at a high level, Twilliger Plaza is a nonprofit, um, which provides independent and assisted li living accommodations for individuals. We have a, a longstanding relationship with Twilliger Plaza. We actually established our hospital facilities authority um, to essentially do a conduit debt issue with Twitter Plaza uh, many, many years ago. And since then, we've had um, other instances of financing through conduit um, with Twitter Plaza. In terms of uh, our authority, um, the county established its hospital facilities authority, I believe, in, in 1998. Um, and the under state statute, the state um, allows for counties and cities to establish hospital facilities authority, which really with it with the aim to expand uh, healthcare services and um, uh, hospital facilities. And within that authority, we're allowed to essentially be a conduit, a, a debt on behalf of nonprofits that further those objectives. But there's four specific um, areas that the state authorizes in terms of uh, financing through conduit. Um, and it's adult uh, congregate living facilities, behavioral health treatment facilities, family safety facilities, and uh, healthcare facilities. And really, the beyond just giving uh, you know greater access to um, certain services to the community within our within our county, the main attractiveness of uh, actually doing a conduit issue is that you can do a tax exempt issue, which lowers the cost of debt uh, for that. Um, that entity doing the debt issue. 
And so in terms of process, um, and this is through county financial and budget policies, is that any conduit debt issue requires from the requester um, essentially a, a letter of intent describing the purpose of any debt issue requested uh, for the hospital facilities authority, the purpose, a historical context, and providing specifics on how this is going to benefit the community within the county and how it fits within our mission and values. Uh, they also provide specific um, financial statements, audited financial statements for a particular period of time. And so what I do is I verify that the request fits uh, state statute requirements and that the entity is a nonprofit. And I also do the financial analysis to make sure that um, future revenues uh, will cover um, the future debt obligations with the debt issue. And other considerations um, before I kind of you know, recommend this uh, for your consideration is that this is not a, an obligation of Multnomah County. It is not reported as a liability in our financial statements, and it does not impact our statutory debt limits or internal debt limits. Um, we simply disclose um, conduit debt issues that the county has uh, done under its hospital facilities authority on an annual basis. And the actual resolution that we prepare is actually per, uh, prepared by our ORIC, our county's bond council. Um, and then we, the county does uh, recover a, a fee for actually um, going through the process of authorizing a conduit debt issue through our um, hospital facilities authority. So now I, I will uh, pass it over to Bob Johnson to specifically talk about this request. And then after that, we'll open it up for questions and comments. Good morning. Uh, I am Bob Johnson, President and CEO of morning. Plaza. I am Bob Johnson, President and CEO of Twilliger Plaza. Uh, thank you, Chair Kafori and Commissioners, for considering the Plaza's request for a bond issue uh, to construct Parkview, a new addition for the Plaza. Twilliger Plaza, a nonprofit continuing care retirement community, which may also be known as a life plan community, opened in 1962, fulfilling the dream of members of the Oregon Retired Teachers Association. The plaza opened with 342 apartments, mostly configured in what we now call studio apartments, mostly serving single teachers as residents. Over the years, Terwilliger has maintained its close ties to the academic community, counting many educators among its residents, from public school teachers to administrators to professors. This continues to the present day. Uniquely, Terwilliger started as and remains a resident governed community. The board is required to have a majority of inside members, as we call them, uh, which means that the majority of the board are persons who are actually residents of Terwilliger Plaza. In its early days, Terwilliger Plaza was an independent living home for retired teachers, providing few with any health services. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, the plaza identified itself as a continuing care retirement community according to the state of Oregon regulations defining CCRCs. In the mid-1990s, to grow as a CCRC, Terwilliger reached out to Multnomah County and then Chair Beverly Stein and asked the county to establish the hospital facility authority for the benefit of Terwilliger Plaza residents. <coughs> Excuse me. Over the years, thanks to multiple uh, conduct and non-recourse revenue bond financings provided by the county and the hospital authority, Terwilliger has added many services to its self-governing senior residents. First, a nursing home was added. It was later replaced by an assisted living building we call the Terrace. Most recently, the Heights opened in 2008, a building project that included independent living apartments, a wellness center, and an aquatic center. Terwilliger grew from only serving persons who were independent to serving residents across the total spectrum of health, from independent to end of life, a true continuum of care. The plaza now has 255 independent living apartments. That's fewer because many of the studios were combined to satisfy the market for larger apartments. And in addition, 61 assisted living apartments. Terwilliger also continues to serve a broad economic demographic, still maintaining smaller, less expensive units. The plaza offers apartments ranging in size from 378 square feet studios to 1,800 square foot, two bedroom plus 
den apartments. We also serve Medicaid residents in our assisted living apartments. About 350 persons call to Williger Plaza home. Early in the life of the Plaza, residents saw the need to care for those residents who outlived their financial resources. In 1967, Terwilliger Plaza formed the Lesta Howell Trust, named after the teacher we look to as our founder, to support residents who depleted their finances. The Lesta Howell Trust is also supported by the Terwilliger Plaza Foundation, which supports the trust and other projects at the Plaza. The Terwilliger Plaza board and residents are proud of the fact that no resident has been asked to leave due to the lack of financial resources. No Terwilliger Plaza resident needs to fear that they will lose their home because of financial difficulties or inability to pay for the services they receive. Terwilliger Plaza employs about 200 persons from frontline caregivers, housekeepers, and dining servers to senior management. We have an annual budget contributing to the Portland economy approaching $20 million. At this stage in its life, the Plaza again recognizes the need to grow. We started construction of a 10-story, 127-unit independent living apartment building to be known as Parkview at Terwilliger Plaza, using the bond issue you approved in 2019 to fund the planning and the start of excavation. Parkview will be, will be connected to the existing plaza buildings with a sky bridge suspended above Southwest 6th Avenue. This growth will allow the plaza to increase the economies of scale and help us to continue to be competitive in the retirement housing market. The expansion will also help us continue to serve the broad economic spectrum that we currently serve. It is important to note that the multiple market analyses that we have conducted from 2018 to the present day show an expanding need for retirement housing in Multnomah County over the next five to 10 years. This building will also set a standard for green construction as it is designed, it, designed and will be built to passive house design standards. Passive house design focuses on the building envelope and high efficiency appliances and, and mechanic, mechanical systems. We also make use of green roof and green wall aspects and solar technology with a solar roof on Parkview and adding panels to the existing buildings. Design models project that this building will use 50% of the energy used by a typical building built to the current building code. Very importantly, this added scale will help Terwilliger remain as an independent resident governed community. As far as we know, Terwilliger Plaza is unique in being the only resident governed nonprofit CCRC in the United States. Maintaining that uniqueness is a high priority for Terwilliger Plaza residents. This bond issue will provide the permanent financing for Parkview at Terwilliger Plaza and allow us to complete the construction of this project and open it to the approximately 200 independent living residents who will live there in late summer 2023 as scheduled. On behalf of our community of active living senior adults, we ask you to support to Williger Plaza in this most worthwhile and exciting project. We thank you for creating the hospital authority for to Williger Plaza and others, and thank you for this and the many other bond financings that have followed over the past 20 plus years. We look forward to continuing to work with the county and its support of senior citizens. Thank you for your consideration. Thank, Thank you. you Are there folks going to testify or just here for questions? Uh, Judy is just here for questions. I don't know about Greg. I'm also here for questions. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, Marina, did we receive any public testimony in this item? No, Madam Chair. Thanks. And I am going to declare a potential conflict of interest on this. I don't believe I have one, but my parents um, have recently purchased an option on one of the condos in this new facility. Um, and with that, I will call on commissioners for questions or comments, and we'll start with Commissioner Myron. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't think this is a conflict either, but since you mentioned that, um, my mother-in-law had uh, had been a resident of Terwilliger Plaza and did have um, did have an exceptional experience there. So um, uh, I um, appreciate your being here. Ex appreciate uh, what you are um, are seeking to do. I have one question for Eric, which is, um, you know, I, I see a number of potential benefits here. I, uh, is is there are there 
downsides to issuance of this? It, it doesn't seem like there are any. And so I, I just wanted to raise that question. I, I would say that, um, you know, I'll let kind of Greg jump in if he wants to too as well, but I, I think it's more so the potential negatives here is if we um, potentially uh, authorize uh, a conduit debt issue with an organization that's maybe not meeting our uh, mission and values in terms of uh, what part of the population or community they're serving, but also um, the potential that they're not financially stable um, and could essentially um, you know, either default or be in position to default in the future. That th those are the the risks that come from doing this. Um, that I think would be negative aspects of doing this. Uh, obviously, I think with Twitter Plaza that that that's not the case. Um, we've we've had that long-standing relationship with them and their organization that's very uh, financially stable and strong. And so, um, and they meet all the you know uh, requirements, state statute, and um, and they're meeting a segment of the population in our community that's very important. So, um, but I, I would say that those are the the risks that I kind of see with us uh, authorizing a, a conduit debt issue. Thanks, thanks so much, Eric. Um, and uh, yeah, I appreciate just understanding those. And as you mentioned, I think fulfilling a very important need and um, and uh, seem in quite. Uh, seem financially stable, so uh, I I support this. Thank you, Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Bob, for for being here. Really appreciate the information. Um, you know, I don't I don't think I have any questions. It seems we've 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 issued these these uh, we've done these debt issues for a long time. I, I guess well, I, I take that back. What, one question you may not have the answers here today, Bob, but if you could follow up, I would appreciate it. Reflecting on the community that you serve, I would be curious about um, sort of demographics of of the community, uh, including race and ethnicity, income levels, and the range of prices on the units. So uh, again, no need to to provide that now. If you have it, that's great. But otherwise, if you could follow up, I would appreciate it. And then, Eric, I just want to raise something you and I have um, talked about, which is I'm interested in figuring out whether there are other organizations that could benefit from this sort of a facility. You know, I know there are parameters. It's around you mentioned family safety, and I can think of organizations that that address family safety. Um, so within those parameters, whether you and I have talked about figuring out whether there's a way that we could see if it's feasible or would be useful to organizations that serve Multnomah County clients, for example, to be able to use this sort of facility. If you could talk a little bit about that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, Commissioner Jayapal. Yeah, we've had discussions on that, and I and I do think it's a good idea to explore because really our hospital facilities authority has not been one of those mechanisms that we've we essentially I guess in a way marketed out in the community. Um, we don't even have a, a necessarily a, a a page for it in our comments that we promote it. It's more of a for those organizations that know it exists, they they know how to go through the process. So it, I think it is filtered down to certain certain entities that take advantage of it. And I do think that uh, further exploration of, of actually, you know, identifying potential other areas where, you know, there could be other nonprofits that that could benefit that serve certain segments of the population just don't know that this is available that can take advantage of it, uh, but would be worth exploring. So actually, I've I've uh, based upon your request, I've um, talked to to Greg and um, Doug with Oric. And we're going to put together a kind of a, a framework of how we might want to approach this and kind of some of the pros and cons and then uh, have a discussion of that with you and the chair and the commissioners uh, on what's the potential there. That's great. Really appreciate that. And I'm, I'm remembering that there's also a comparable education facility. So, you know, maybe we could wrap that in as well into the analysis. Yeah, absolutely. We, we don't have a, a, a facility for. The educational piece, but that county has done one in the past many, many years ago um, with Concordia, um, but I, it will we'll incorporate that as well. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, chair. Um, thank you, Eric, for the um, 
the really thorough discussion about this. I know we have done this in the past, most recently in 2019, um, and I'm familiar with that. And um, Bob, I just want to say how much I appreciate you sharing the information about Williger Praza, the way that you've grown and the and the way that you have supported the community and given um, a place for people to 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 stay, so that and and doing it in a way that people can. Um, live there and, and be supported if ne if necessary with these funds. So I don't have any questions, but just um, just appreciate your time today. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Bob and Eric. I did have a couple of questions. Uh, Eric, uh, if uh, for some reason, and I'm sure this would never happen because it sounds like Terwilliger Plaza is very financially sound, but how does a default reflect on the county. Maybe I'll have uh, Greg help me on this one too, but um, it, it, it's it, obviously we don't want to get in a situation where um, our hospital facilities authority is, is authorizing debt where there's a default. Um, it could make um, any future um, request uh, less attractive, obviously. And, and we, we've done these with other, organ other nonprofits and so we don't want to jeopardize that, uh, you know, uh, opportunity that may be there in the future for others. And so um, that that's the negative aspect of it. It's obviously not, it's not an obligation of, of Multnomah County. We wouldn't have to uh, essentially step in to support in any capacity. It's just, I think, from my perspective, it's that uh, we may lose um, some of the the um, benefits uh, that this brings, not only to the one that's struggling, but any future. Um, requesters of this um, uh, authority. So anything you'd want to add, Greg, to that? Yeah, thank you, Eric. And, and I'm Greg Blount. I would just add that in the legal documentation for the transition, we made clear what Eric just said, that the county's not responsible for obtaining the bonds. In addition, we include provisions in, uh, that was section eight. Yeah. Yeah. To work your class, it would not find county and Greg, it's really hard to understand yeah. you. I don't thank you. Is that better? Is that better? In addition, in the legal documentation, where would your whole asset agrees to indemnify the county and possible facility and any costs that might be associated with future problems? So we take the legal steps necessary to. Make sure can county is insulated should anything go along with the bonds. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate um, those explanations. Uh, and then just another question. So do you have to be an educator to live there or can anybody live there? No, you do not have to be an educator to live there. Uh, the only requirement is uh, is one has to be 62 years of age or older. Uh, so that, yeah. And uh, another question, you know, with this excessive heat, uh, I'm thinking a lot about building code. Uh, do uh, your units have air conditioning uh, and will the new building or will all the units have air conditioning? Uh, the short answer is, is yes, we are fully edu uh, educated. We are fully uh, <laughs> <laughs> we are fully air conditioned there. Uh, yes, and uh, and actually we uh, we were very pleased, even with the oldest of the building, which of course the air conditioning in our main tower building, which was built in 1962, was a retrofit, you know, many many years ago. But um, we really were able to uh, maintain uh, comfortable temperatures in there, uh, even through the, the the real excessive heat. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. I'm really appreciative that you are adding to our housing stock, especially for uh, this segment, this population. Uh, it's really needed and um, I'm excited that we'll have an additional 200 more units if approved. Thank you. Thank you. Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron. Aye. Commissioner Jaipal. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori. Aye. The resolution is adopted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. We really appreciate your support.
We will now adjourn as the Hospital Facilities Authority of Multnomah County and reconvene as the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners. R9, ratification of tentative agreement between Multnomah County and Oregon Nurse Nurses Association for a one-year extension to the collective bargaining agreement. Summoned. Second. Commissioner Stegman moves. Commissioner Bagan Peterson seconds. Approval of R9. Morning, Shelley. Hi, how are y'all doing today? I'm Shelly Kent, the county's labor relations director. I use she, her pronouns. I'm here today to ask the board's ratification of the agreement between the county and the Oregon Nurses Association for a one year rollover of existing contract terms from July 1st, 2021 to June 30th of 2022. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and state of emergency, the parties evaluated the bargaining process and bilaterally determined it would be beneficial to reach a short term agreement for one year rather than doing full success for successor contract bargaining. This contract consists of 1.6% COLA for a cost of 375,000 in salary and related expenses. It also carries over any unused Juneteenth holidays from the last fiscal year to this fiscal year. And otherwise, we are maintaining the status quo. The ONA's membership is approximately 252 employees. And I just really want to acknowledge the work that ONA and county management did to reach this agreement. It's expected that the parties will return to the table in the fall or winter to resume full contract negotiations. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Shelley. Marina, did we receive any public testimony on this item? No, Madam Chair. All right, we'll have questions and comments, starting with Commissioner Stegman. No questions. Thank you, ONA, and thank you, Shelley. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley, for um, the update and the work on this um, that you did and that ONA did. I just had a question. We we have a lot of these like one year rollover because of COVID and things like that. Are, is this do we think this is the last one or do we have a couple more in the pipeline? Um, in terms of rollovers, I think we're probably going to start going into full success for contract negotiations. And the next one I'm about to talk about is a four year deal. So we are still doing real negotiations as well as um, rollovers. Okay, great. Well, no, I my question real, was around... I say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said real. We, a rollover is a real negotiation, but a full contract negotiation. Yes, this contract is very real. We know that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, no, it was, it was about the rollovers. Just curious about that. So thanks for answering that question. Yeah, and the reason why the parties like to do rollovers is when things are unstable just staying with current contract terms brings some stability for a year. And so that's why it's mutually desirable. Commissioner Chair, Paul. Thank you, Chair. No questions. Just want to appreciate the work. And Shelley, I also want to appreciate the fact that you seem excited about the next set of contract <laughs> negotiations. I think that's that's a terrific qualification for your job. So thank you so much. Yes, I, I do actually enjoy the art of bargaining. Commissioner Myron. I love that. Thank you. Um, and no questions. I just want to thank and appreciate you, Shelley, for the work that you're doing. And um, you are fabulous, as I tell you on a regular oh, basis. Thank because you. You are. And thank you to ONA um, for this one year rollover. And with that, Marina, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The agreement is approved. R10, Aye. ratification of tentative agreement between Multnomah County and Multnomah County Prosecuting Attorneys Association for a four year collective bargaining agreement. Second. Second. Commissioner Stegman moves. Commissioner Jayapal seconds. Approval of R10. Welcome back. Thank you. I missed y'all. Um, so I'm also here today to ask for your ratification um, between the county and the Multnomah County Prosecuting Attorneys Association for a four-year uh, agreement covering uh, July 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2025. The cost for the first year is a 1.6 COLA. It's 248000 and then for the subsequent years, we will have COLA between 1 and 4%, depending upon the consumer price index. 
Uh, we also formalized Juneteenth as a paid holiday, which costs between 62 and $68,000. We've increased the term life insurance, which is currently one time salary to a maximum of 50,000. And now the maximum will be 250,000. That cost is just under $11,000. We've added a 5% lead deputy premium, and that designation is at the discretion of the district attorney. It's unknown at this time how many leads he would appoint. So it's difficult to come up with an overall cost, but for year one, the cost of one lead is $12,138. The cost of the contract in the first year is estimated to be $314,990. This ratification would impact 73 employees. And I just really, really appreciate the work that the association and the county management did to reach a four year agreement. A four year is a substantial amount of time, and that also brings stability for both employees and management. And so I'm very happy to answer any questions you may have about this. Marina, did we receive any public testimony on this uh, item? No, Madam Chair. All right. Uh, Commissioner Myron, questions, comments? No questions, but uh, thank you yet again. And that's that's very exciting. And yeah, four years, that that's a great testament and really excited. Thanks. Commissioner Jayapal. No questions, just thank you and congratulations. Commissioner Vega Peterson. No, no questions either. And this is a great, good, good contract. Thank you. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. No questions. Uh, thank you to the Prosecuting Attorneys Association and Shelly. And you just look so positive and happy, and I really appreciate your energy. Thank you so much, because I will be coming back soon with two more. <laughs> we cannot wait. Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The agreement is approved. Thanks, Shelley. R11, bud budget modification LIB 00122, uh, position changes due to location reopening. So moved. Second. Commissioner Stegman moves. Commissioner Vega Peterson seconds. Approval of R11. Good morning, Don. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. My name is Don Allgaier, Director of Operations for the Library. I use he, him pronouns. You have before you a budget modification to modify 18 positions at the library, which will result in a net reduction of 0.5 FTE. The changes will not increase or decrease the adopted library department budget. The library is thrilled to be reopening library buildings and welcoming people back into the branch libraries. As you know, the library has operated with reduced staffing during the building closures and then withholds pickup services. As location managers are preparing to re or to open library branches, they are evaluating vacancies to make sure that they have the positions they need to meet their operational needs. The positions in this budget modification will provide an array of in-building services, such as shelving, materials processing, and customer service. Many of the positions in the budget modification will also have KSAs that support increased access to staff with uh, language and cultural skills that connect the library's mission to our communities. These changes reflect a library system that is not just reopening to the public, but opening in new ways and connecting to more people when they walk into the library. I'm glad to answer any questions. Marina, did we receive any public testimony on this item? No, Madam Chair. Okay, how about uh, Commissioner Myron, questions or comments? Uh, no questions or comments. Thank you, Don. Commissioner Jayapal? Thanks, Don, no questions. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? No questions, I think we're all happy. The libraries are reopening, thank you. And Commissioner Stegman? No questions, woohoo, libraries opening. Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The budget modification is approved. 
Thank you. R12, Notice of Intent for MCL Digital Reach ARPA Project for Library to Receive American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 Grant Funds for Digital Inclusion through the State of Library, State of Library of Oregon. So moved. Second. Second. Commissioner Jayapal moves. Commissioner Vega Peterson seconds. Approval of R12. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I'm John Warona, Director of Content Strategy for the Library, and I oversee IT and our digital equity and inclusion efforts. I use he, him pronouns. I'm here today to request your support for our grant proposal to the State Library of Oregon for an IMLS grant funded by the American Rescue Plan Act. Our project is to use $112,800 in grant funds to help digitally underserved Multnomah County community members get connected to high-speed internet and Chromebooks through our tech lending program. The library will provide access to high-speed internet with 100 free hotspots and one year of service with distribution prioritized for black, indigenous, and communities of color, Latinx, Asian, and immigrant and refugee communities. We'll purchase some new hardware and software, specifically 100 Chromebooks to loan out to patrons and we'll offer pop-up computer labs and tech support in diverse communities. We'll also prioritize some specific uh, marketing outreach uh, funding as a part of this grant to reach those communities. The uh, Institute of Museum and Library Services, IMLS, awarded the State Library funding from the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, these funds are not for services funded in the library tech mobile. That is being funded by county ARPA funds. These funds were not yet announced through the State Library of Oregon when we were making the Techmobile request. Uh, so thank you again for your support of that project, which has since kicked off and is in planning and procurement activities now. Um, in regard to today's NOI, uh, IMLS directed that these funds be used to achieve the American Rescue Plan Act's purposes in alignment with the goals of the State Library. This funding is to help communities respond directly and immediately to the pandemic, as well as to related economic and community needs through equitable approaches. And so our proposal is in line with IMLS priority to, quote, support digital inclusion efforts to enable libraries to reach residents, such as through internet hotspots, accessible Wi-Fi, and digital content and related resources, particularly in support of education, health, and workforce development needs. Um, so the State Library prioritized some focal areas and we're in alignment with four of the five, which are connectivity, digital equity and inclusion, workforce development, and needs arising from the pandemic. That is it for my uh, overview. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, John, and I love your background. Marina, did we receive any public testimony on this item? No, Madam Chair. All right, uh, questions from commissioners, uh, Commissioner Stegman. No questions. Thank you, John, for the great work. Commissioner Vega Peterson. This is great. No questions. Thank you, John. Commissioner Jayapal. No questions. Thanks, John. Commissioner Myron. No questions, but love the background as well. Uh, thanks, John. Marina, will you please take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Commissioner Stegman? Aye. Chair Kafori? Aye. The notice of intent is approved. Thank you. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your support and I'll echo the woohoo to libraries reopening. Thank you. All right, uh, now is the time for any non agenda items uh, discussion conversation. Commissioner Myron. Um, I do not have any items. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you chair. Just want to mention a community event in my district. It's been. Great to have community events happening in person and being able to go in person. Um, this one is a celebration of the village market in New Columbia. It used to be for 20 years. It's been run by Janus Youth. It's now splitting off to its own entity and they're having a celebration this Saturday 
uh, I believe from noon to two or thereabouts, and I'll be there. So I uh, would love to have others join me. Thanks. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to remind people that this Saturday from 9 to 1130, um, I'm hosting with the Division Midway Alliance uh, East Portland cleanup event. People can register for this on Solve's website. I'm very excited about um, this chance to um, do good things with people in the community. And then I, um, we're also doing it this weekend because on Sunday from noon to two, is the ta the Division Midway Alliance's Taste of Nations. This is an annual event in East Portland. Obviously, we weren't able to have it last year, um, but they're bringing it back. It's a great um, chance to enjoy the very diverse food that East Portland has to offer. And so this is gonna be Sunday, July 25th from noon to two at the Division Midway um, Alliance office. So um, hope people can come out and join for one of those activities. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, reminder uh, for folks uh, to join the People's Market at Rockwood. Uh, the Chair and I will be out there to uh, encourage vaccinations. Uh, but this is a monthly, uh, or actually it's a weekly event. So it starts uh, from 4 to 7 p.m. It's at the Sunrise Center on 189th in Burnside. And uh, it's at the Sunrise Center. And it is specific to help support black and indigenous farmers and makers. Uh, and so they really want to support BIPOC growers. So it's a great farmer's market. Uh, there'll be lots of vendors and it's an event you can go to every Thursday. Lots going on in the community this weekend. It's awesome. Thank you everyone. Um, that concludes our meeting this morning and uh, we do not have any meetings scheduled next week so um, next week we will be all doing other things important work for the people of Multnomah County and we will meet again together on August the 10th for a board briefing at 10 a.m. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, take care. Thanks.